On April 14, 1865, an assassin walked into the presidential box at Ford's Theater and forever changed the course of American history. President Abraham Lincoln, his wife, Mary Todd Lincoln, and box mates Clara Harris and Henry Rathbone were watching the second act of the play, Our American Cousin, when John Wilkes Booth exacted his revenge by shooting and fatally wounding President Lincoln. With that single shot, President Lincoln became a martyr to many in the North. President Lincoln's unfortunate and untimely death led to a sudden interest in every component of the fallen president's life. After Lincoln's death, William Herndon, Lincoln's longtime law partner and friend, devoted much of his life to researching the overlooked memories of Lincoln. His search led him to many sites, such as New Salem, where Lincoln became a lawyer and first ran for office. Also, and potentially most important, it led him to Spencer County, Indiana, Lincoln's boyhood home of 14 years. Lincoln himself later recalled the childhood days he spent there on a short visit and created a poem titling it, My Childhood Home I See Again, my childhood home, home I see I again, see again and, saddened. and saddened with the view. And still as memory crowds my brain, there's pleasure in it too. O memory, thou midway world, twixt earth and paradise, where things decayed and loved ones lost and dreamy shadows rise. And free from all that's earthly vile, seemed hallow, pure and bright like scenes in some enchanted isle, all bathed in liquid light. Through his correspondence with many in Lincoln's past, Herndon provides first-hand accounts and stories from those who knew the president as a child and young man. After Lincoln was assassinated, Herndon became concerned because he was reading the biographies of Lincoln, and it was not the Lincoln that he knew. They were making Lincoln look like somebody who was this, this perfect man, and um, it wasn't a real person. So Herndon decided he wanted to write the real story about Lincoln. Now Herndon knew about the Lincoln of Springfield, the lawyer Lincoln, but he didn't know much about the Lincoln b before that time. So he started to make some contacts in the New Salem area uh, uh, where Lincoln became a lawyer and was a store clerk and so forth. But he didn't want to just limit this to the Illinois period. He wanted to know about Lincoln's Indiana years and Kentucky years. Shortly after Lincoln's assassination, Herndon wrote a letter and addressed it simply to some good union lawyer, Rockport, Indiana. That lawyer made some inquiries and then wrote Herndon back and said, here are some names of people you should contact, and he gave him a couple of, of stories. Herndon followed up on that and wrote those people, uh, and they began to uh, have correspondence. But Herndon also decided he wanted to come and see the place where Lincoln had had lived and actually talked to the people directly. So in September of 1865, Herndon actually made a trip to southern Indiana, to Spencer County. In an interview conducted by Herndon on September 14, 1865, of Nathaniel Grigsby and others, Herndon walks through the places that Nathaniel Grigsby recounts as significant in Lincoln's early years. He begins his trip with Nathaniel Grigsby at the Lincoln Farm. He recalls that the farm is about a half mile east of Gentryville and a little north. The Lincolns first came to Indiana in the year of 1816, the year that Indiana officially became a state. They had originally lived in Kentucky. However, several disputes concerning the ownership and titles of land encouraged Thomas Lincoln to look for some security and the opportunity to acquire more land. The entire Lincoln family, Thomas, Nancy, Abe, and Sarah, began their journey in the year of 1816. Their mode of transportation is not known. However, it is generally believed that they rode horses or covered wagons due to the fact that Thomas Lincoln listed four horses for taxation 
in the year of 1815. They made their way to the Anderson River, which connected to the Ohio River, and took a short ferry ride. When they reached Indiana, they began the intensely difficult part of their journey, making their way through the untamed wilderness. After much toil and what Lincoln comments as some of the hardest work of his life, they reached their home site and temporary camp, which many consider the first cabin that the Lincolns lived in. Thomas Lincoln immediately began the process of building a permanent residence for the family. He chose a site on the top of a small knoll and along with Abe began the hard work. It is also believed that the second cabin was finished by Lincoln's eighth birthday, February 12th, 1817. This second cabin is remembered as about 18 by 20 feet, constructed of unhewn or round logs. It had a chimney on the west side, one window and an open door. It faced northwest. The Lincolns lived in this cabin during their stay in Indiana and it was here he transitioned from a small boy to a young man. In the year 1829, Thomas and Abe, just 20 years old, began to build a second cabin. It is this cabin that Herndon and Nathaniel Grigsby encountered and described as, The house is a one-story hewed log, one porch in front. It is not the house that Lincoln lived in, though. He built it. This cabin also had two windows, a chimney at the east side, two doors that were on the north and south sides, and two rooms. Herndon believes that Lincoln never lived in it because in the year 1830, the Lincoln Johnston family sold their farm to James Gentry and moved to Illinois. Today, cast models of this last cabin have been placed on the Lincoln Farm and the Lincoln Boyhood National Memorial. Bronze models of the frame, hearthstones, and chimney memorialize the home and family of a great president. William Herndon and Nathaniel Grigsby continued their trip through Lincoln's neighborhood to search for Nancy Hanks' gravesite. Herndon located Nancy Hanks' grave using description from Lincoln and Dennis Hanks. Herndon reflects about the woman buried beneath. God bless her, if I could breathe life into her again, I would do it. Could I only whisper in her ear, your son was President of the United States from 1861 to 1865. I would be satisfied. I have heard much of this blessed good woman. I stood bareheaded in reverence at her grave. I can't say why, yet I felt in the presence of the living woman translated to another world. God bless her, said her son to me once, and I repeat that which echoes audibly in my soul. God bless her. Nancy Hanks Lincoln's life was taken due to an epidemic that began devastating settlers in 1818, the milk sickness. Milk sickness is caused by consuming milk products that have been tainted by the consumption of the white snake root plant. Although cows do not generally eat white snake root, when a year is particularly dry and it flourishes, they tend to feed on it because there is simply not much else to eat. Nancy Hanks Lincoln's death is, uh, is typical of that. It happened in October. It was a, a dry year. The cows ate the, the plant, the milk was poisoned. Uh, she was not the only one at that time to die in this community. Her aunt and uncle, Thomas and Elizabeth Sparrow, had died shortly before she died, and she probably went and took care of them. Uh, Nancy Bruner, another neighbor, died at the same time. Uh, and so we don't know exactly why she was the only one of the immediate Lincoln family that died. Some speculate that she drank the milk from one of the neighbor's cows. Uh, we really don't know. But it was not a, a pleasant death, <laughs> if there is such a thing. Uh, it's called the tremble, sometimes also called the puking disease because it affects the nervous system and it, uh, it becomes, uh, it's a rather a violent death. Uh, and uh, one of the, the uh, symptoms uh, I've been told is that when doctors are uh, would enter the, the cabins, they would know if there was milk sickness because of the, 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 the breath smell, that it had a, a, a very pungent odor, the people who had it. This devastating disease caused both children to take on not only a large amount of responsibility at an early age, but also sadness and grief. 
Thomas Lincoln quickly realized the void left in his and in his children's lives. And a year after Nancy Hanks Lincoln passed away, Thomas traveled back to Kentucky and made a very practical match to a widower with three children, Sarah Bush Johnston. Sarah brought a more womanly aspect to the home, making some improvements in what she described as a good, a good log, log cabin, cabin, tolerably comfortable, promoting cleanliness and a good appearance. Dennis Hanks recalls her profound effect on the children. Mrs. Lincoln proved an excellent stepmother. When she came into Indiana, Abe and his sister was wild, raggedy, and dirty. She soaped, rubbed, and washed the children clean so that they looked pretty well and clean. She sewed and mended their clothes, and the children once more looked human as their own good mother left them. At this time, Lincoln was about 12, and his interest in knowledge and reading began to flourish with every book he could get his hands on. Sarah, or Sally Bush Johnston's arrival, provided more books, such as Webster's Speller, Robinson Crusoe, and The Arabian Nights, for Lincoln to eagerly peruse. William Herndon and Nathaniel Grigsby continued their walk through Lincoln's neighborhood, south for about a half a mile, to Samuel Howe's home site and the well-known spring that is located very close to it. William Herndon takes a moment at this site. I then proceed to old Samuel Howell's house, south of the graveyard about one half mile. Drank out of a good spring near the Little Pigeon meeting house out of which Abe had kneeled and drank a thousand times. This spring was an important factor in many decisions in the Little Pigeon Creek community. Its location helped determine the site of the Little Pigeon Baptist Church. The Little Pigeon Baptist Church was formed in 1816 in Warwick County, Indiana. Its members wished to create a meeting house, and in 1821, they all approved a plan to build one on the Noah Gordon Farm. It was conveniently located by the Howell Spring and a nearby road that led to Troy. It is most likely that because Thomas Lincoln was the most experienced at building, he was chosen to lead and oversee the creation of the new meeting house. The first meeting house constructed was 30 by 26 feet hewed logs, eight feet in the understory, and six feet above the joists. Abraham and his father both helped construct the meeting house that Herndon encounters with Nathaniel in his trip around the neighborhood. Went through the church, stealing in at the windows. The pulpit was made by Thomas Lincoln. I cut a small piece therefrom as a memento. After walking through the church, Herndon and Nathaniel went about 50 yards into the large graveyard. Saw the grave of Sarah Lincoln, Mrs. Grigsby, Abe's sister. God bless her ashes. In this graveyard lies Sarah Lincoln Grigsby, Lincoln's younger sister and her unborn child. Sarah Lincoln married Aaron Grigsby in 1826. A little less than a year and a half later, she and her unborn child died in childbirth on January 20th, 1828. It is recounted that Lincoln was working for Reuben Grigsby, Aaron's father, when he was told the news. He sat down in the door of the smokehouse and buried his face in his hands. The tears slowly trickled from between his bony fingers and his gaunt frame shook with sobs. Although it could be contributed to his inconsolable grief, Lincoln always blamed the Grigsby family for the sudden death of his sister. He believed they let her lay or bleed for too long during her childbirth. Herndon and Grigsby continue east from Sarah's grave and eventually viewed the Andrew Crawford School site. Crawford Schoolhouse lies east of the church, east of the graveyard, a place enclosed in a field. Schoolhouse long since rotted away and gone. Throughout his younger years, it is widely documented that Lincoln was interested in education and the pursuit of knowledge. Even though his schooling was sparse, Lincoln's education began at an early age. Lincoln's formal education began with a school in Kentucky that he attended for a short time under his teachers Zachariah Riney and Caleb Hazel. It continued when he traveled to Indiana. However, as he stated, There was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education. Indiana, a fledgling state, had yet to develop a strong school system. The schools that did exist usually met the standards of reading, writing, and ciphering to the rule of three. During Lincoln's stay in Indiana, 
he is said to have gone to three schools taught by three different people. The first, and the location that Nathaniel Grigsby recalls, was the Andrew Crawford School. Next was Azel W. Dorsey's and then James Sweeney's. Well, I think when we talk about Lincoln, we need to talk about schooling and we need to talk about education. Schooling, of course, is actually physically being in a school. Uh, Lincoln's education was much more than that. Lincoln himself says that the aggregate of all of his schooling amounted to less than one year. That schooling actually starts in Kentucky. He goes to two schools in Kentucky, and then he comes to Indiana, and he attended three different schools in Indiana. Now, these were schools that met for just a few months in the winter of the year. Uh, they were not public schools. There was no such thing as a public school at that time, even though the state constitution said that there should be public schools. He learned a lot from these teachers. I think one of the most interesting things is that in one of his autobiographical statements, he talks somewhat about education and the fact that he only had a, a year of it. And he's apologetic, actually, that uh, that's all the schooling that he had. But he goes on in this statement and he lists the names of all five of his teachers, the two in Kentucky and the three in Indiana. I find that amazing that uh, all these years later, Lincoln remembered the names of his teachers. These are the people that he only was with totally for a year, and yet he remembers them. And when he's running for the presidency, that's important enough for him to give you the names of all five of his teachers. He mentions in the same statement that he has sons. He doesn't mention the names of his sons, but he mentions the names of, of his teachers. I think that says something about the importance of schooling in the uh, mind of Lincoln. Nathaniel Grigsby, who attended the same schools at the same time as Lincoln, recalled the school experience. We had to go about two miles to school. When we started to school, we had Dilworth's spelling book and the American spelling book. We only wrote, spelled, and ciphered. We had spelling matches frequently. Abe was always the head of all the classes he ever was in. Essays and poetry were not taught in the school, Abe took it upon his own accord. Cannot remember of his reading any book or books except Aesop's Fables, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, the Bible, Robinson Crusoe, Life of Washington, and Dupree's Hymn Book. The story of a young Abraham's misfortune with one of the books, Nathaniel's recalls, Weems' Life of Washington, followed him throughout his career and campaigned for the presidency. On May 23, 1860, an article appeared in the Evansville Daily Journal depicting the story and demonstrating Lincoln's honesty and morality. In the story, Lincoln borrowed a copy of the book from one of his neighbors, Josiah Crawford, because he was in no financial state to buy the book, but was very interested in reading it. While the book was in his possession, he happened to leave it in the cracks in the cabin wall, and it began to rain, making the book so wet it was completely ruined. Facing his mistake, Abe went to Josiah and told him of what had happened. Lincoln had no money to give, so he offered to work to pay for the book. Josiah set him to pull fodder for two days, and Lincoln compensated the loss. This story was a great example of Lincoln's honesty and his willingness to acquire more knowledge. William Herndon and Nathaniel Grigsby continued on their walk towards John Romine's home and met him in the road. Romine, 60 at this time, told Herndon about Lincoln's travels to New Orleans. Lincoln went to New Orleans about 28 or 29, hauled some of the bacon to the river, not for Lincoln, but for Gentry. Abe didn't like to work it, didn't raise more than was enough for family and stock. Boat started out of the Ohio in the spring. Abe, about 20 years of age, started from Rockport, a short distance below, rather, give about two meters. Lincoln was attacked by the Negroes. No doubt of this, Abe told me so, saw the scar myself. Suppose that the Wade Hampton farm were nearby, probably below at a widow's farm. It is generally accepted that in April of 1828, Lincoln and Allen Gentry embarked on their journey to New Orleans. This would have been an exciting time for Lincoln, who had yet to have gone anywhere besides Kentucky and Indiana. However, his departure was probably overshadowed and a little motivated by the recent death of his sister, Sarah. 
I think one misconception about that trip is many people feel that they went directly to New Orleans and sold the, the produce, and, and that's not really true. Um, they, they sold the things as they went down, particularly the Mississippi River. There were the, the plantations along the way, and they would stop and sell the, the hams or whatever, um, and actually were attacked uh, along what they call the Sugar Coast. And I don't know if they were slaves or they were ex-slaves, but uh, uh, they were attacked along the way. There's some question, and, and historians don't agree as to exactly what happened when they got to New Orleans. Certainly this trip was uh, uh, an eye-opening experience for this young man from the frontier. Lincoln had seen slavery in Kentucky. I mean, there's no question about that. Uh, Maybe Lincoln didn't see slave auctions before he went to New Orleans, and he probably saw it there. And there, you know, there, there are legends that he says if he ever gets a chance to hit that, he will hit it hard. But it had to be uh, one of the most, in, most significant experiences of his Indiana years. After their encounter with John Romine, Herndon and Grigsby continue on to the Noah Gordon Mill. Saw old man Gordon's mill rather near ruins of it. This is the mill where Abe got kicked by a horse. Hunted for Lincoln's name written in the black lead grease on a shaft of the mill. Couldn't find it. Got a cog or two at the mill. Bought where Herndon hunted for Lincoln's name and stole a couple of cogs was as Herndon stated, the mill where Abe got kicked by a horse. You bring your sack of grain and uh, bring your horse and you wait at your turn and in this case uh, Lincoln's turn came late in the day, and he hitched up the horse, and uh, he was sitting on the arm of, of the mill, and every time the horse came by, he would use the whip and tell it to get up. Actually, he would say, get up, you old hussy. Um, and uh, the horse didn't particularly appreciate that, and at one of these times when he, uh, the horse came walking by, uh, the horse kicked Lincoln. He kicked him in the head. Um, Lincoln fell to the ground, Noah Gordon came running and saw the young man who was uh, bleeding, and Gordon decided that probably he was dead. Uh, he calls for T Thomas Lincoln, Abraham's father, and they come and, and get him and take him home, and uh, he's unconscious, uh, and I'm sure they're fearful that, that he will not recover. But he does, early in the morning, after a number of hours being unconscious. He begins to move and uh, begins to jerk somewhat and his tongue loosens and when he was kicked, he was saying this line about get up yo hussy, but it was in the middle of the sentence where he was kicked. So he only said get up yo or get up and when he awoke and here are the people around his bed and his stepmother and everybody and uh, the first thing he says is yo hussy, finishing the line that uh, was interrupted. By, by the kick of the horse. Now, that's another important event in Lincoln's view of his Indiana years. So important that he actually includes that in one of the autobiographical statements. He said, I was kicked and killed for a while. Um, and we have to go again to Herndon to understand the importance of that. Why Lincoln saw that as a significant thing. Herndon said Lincoln was fascinated about that and he talked about that incident frequently in the law office. And, and, and Lincoln tried to figure out how the human mind works that it would do that, that, the, that uh, he would be kicked and the sentence would be stopped and then when he regained consciousness he would uh, finish that, that, uh, that sentence. So that was a fascinating thing for him and, and so when Herndon comes he asks people about that. Herndon finds the old where, the, where the, the, the mill was, and that was one of the things he wanted to see. Herndon and Grigsby's walk stopped after this last visit. It is easy to picture why Herndon would steal a souvenir or two from some of Abraham Lincoln's greatest memories, a memento from the childhood of an immeasurably admired man. Although Lincoln's time in Indiana may not always be remembered as quickly or looked upon as fondly, it shaped the man that became a great president. The memories and places found here allowed the discovery of more about the president that gave so much for his country 
and follow the footsteps left behind through Lincoln's neighborhood.